<laughs> this is the 165th interview of the Bronx African American History Project. We are here with Joe Conzo, who is the first hip hop photographer, whose grandmother is a pioneering ra radical and uh, South Bronx uh, activist, activist Evelina Antonetti whose mother is a leader of the United Bronx Parents and whose father was the major scholar of Tito Puente. So we have a lot to talk about. With us today is Maxine Gordon, our jazz researcher, uh, Marvin Cabrera from Double Discovery at Columbia, who is our guest, and our videographer, Dawn Russell. Today is... What is Tuesday? May, 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 <laughs> May 9th, and we're at Fordham University. Okay. So, uh, to start off, Joe, tell us a little bit about your family, how they came to New York City and the yeah. Bronx. Um, my grandmother was Evelyn Antonetti, was born in Puerto Rico. She came over, migrated over to Puerto Rico during that large Puerto Rican migration in, you know, the late 40s, early 50s, I guess, that was, and she came over, you know, went to school here, and married here, and I guess got her, you know, her start in activism when she moved to the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother's credited with uh, starting bilingual, bilingual education in the public schools back mm -hmm. in the late 60s and 70s, also starting the summer lunch programs, feeding the inner city kids, the youths of the Bronx, mm -hmm. and she started an organization called United Bronx Parents, which it started out as a PTA, a Parents Teachers Association, but grew into a community organization which my mother now runs 30, almost 35 years later, mm -hmm. and today the program consists of uh, rehabs for women with children, drug rehabs, <coughs> feeding the homeless drug prevention programs, uh, HIV prevention programs, ESL programs, English as Second Language programs. So it's a whole host of community-grown mm -hmm. workshops and <coughs> programs for community people. Mm -hmm. When your grandmother moved to the Bronx, what neighborhood did she move to? Uh, um, let's see, Westchester and Jackson Avenue? That would be, that's the, the hub? Is that mm. part of the hub? Um, I guess you'd call it Mon Haven. Mon Haven, okay. Yeah. Right. What yeah. school was the PTA at, that first PTA? I think PS25, uh -huh. which uh -huh. PS25 in the Bronx was the first bilingual school to open up. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, and, um, my mother went there, her kids went there, so we all went mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Uh -huh. So your family remained in the same section? Same section of the Bronx until today. We're still pretty much in the same mm -hmm. section. Now, were you living in uh, private or publicly owned housing? Publicly. Public. I mean, I grew up the St. Mary Projects. On oh, you grew up Street. in the St. Mary Houses? Yeah, you know, I remember when the plane hit, crashed into St. Mary Park back in, I don't know, 67, 68. Uh -huh. You know, right. that was my playground growing up. Right. And what about your grandmother? Was her first residence in public housing? Of course. Yeah. In St. Mary's or? No, the other projects on Westchester and Jackson. Oh, the Jackson houses. Jackson. Okay, so yeah. she went into yeah. the Jackson house. Yeah. So your family's one of the great public housing yeah. success stories. Yeah. And then, uh -huh. you know, from, from there, we moved into... Uh, the Michelangelo apartments across the street from Lincoln Hospital. Mm -hmm. We were one of the first families right. to move into those, those mm -hmm. projects. Now, I want to talk about two themes in your family, music and politics. <laughs> so let's do politics first. Uh, what was your grandmother's political history? My grandmother was a community activist. Everything she did, she, she lived and died for her community of the Bronx. Mm -hmm. Whether it was from education to, you know, food, better quality of food, parent teachers, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it was a turbulent time. You know, there weren't that many, La you know, Latino or, or black politicians at the time. So, you know, 
today, you know, people like Freddie Ferrer and, you know, Congressman Roberto Garcia, you know, all these people are credited, you know, give thanks to my grandmother for mm -hmm. having them start, you know, giving them their start. Did she oh, have her a Ladilla, her yeah, Ladilla, right. you know? Did she have a labor movement background at all? Her labor, yeah. She worked for, and forgive me if I don't remember, Mark, Mark, Vito Mark Antonio. Yes. Antonio. Oh, Vito Mark Antonio. Mark Antonio. So she sense. worked under that's Mark Antonio. Yeah. yeah, that's where she worked. That's where she worked. Wow. Wow. Where was she uh, born in Puerto Rico? Salinas. In Salinas. Salinas, Puerto Rico. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And did she live in East Harlem first? I think at one time. She lived in East Harlem. Uh -huh. And then she worked for Mark and Tony. Yeah. Do you know what she did? Was she like... Uh, she was one of, the, one of his youth workers in the uh -huh. beginning. Uh -huh. you know? okay. And That's what about... probably where her politician... Her right. Her oh, boy. Uh -huh. yeah. What about school? Where did she go to school? <sighs> I mean, like college and stuff um, like that. Got I know she went to Hunter. She also taught at Hunter College. Mm. Um... Their, their library is named after her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Porter Institute, whatever. As far as school. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Who's school? Who's school? Who are who are some of the people who are around your home as a kid when 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 uh, your grandmother was active? I mean, who's who in the Puerto Rican politics? You know, among Velez, um, um, Carmen Arroyo, Ramon Jimenez. I mean, you, you just, it goes on and on and on. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, God, I don't even know where to begin. Right. It's just so many people. Yeah. Now, let's move to the music. Uh, well, that's another uh, big part of your family. Yeah. Um, your father was very close to Tito My Puente. father was Tito Puente's... Uh, Manager, assistant, publicist for the last you know, 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. And through my father, I was introduced to, you know, Tito Puentes, Andy Cruz, Hector Laval, you know, Candido, mm -hmm. you name it, everybody. Mm -hmm. What was your father's educational background? Was he trained as a journalist? Mm -hmm. No, my father it was a struggling conga player. He oh, just wow. couldn't, you know, make it as a as a gonga player mm -hmm. and he just struck up a friendship with tito i guess you know i'm not sure but maybe the hunts point palace was the first time they had met mm -hmm. and your father from the bronx also? yeah mm -hmm. from the same what area also from out here yeah mm -hmm. also but spanish home first and then, and then okay. yeah and how many children did your grandmother have how many siblings did my grandmother have? had three kids, mm -hmm. my mother and my aunt and my uncle, mm -hmm. and then my father had myself and my brother. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And where did your parents meet? Probably St. Mary's. Uh-huh. <laughs> St. Mary's Park. Uh-huh. Or maybe at one of the jams on, on you know, Southern Boulevard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, when you were growing up, do you recall going to live music in the Bronx? Yeah, my father used to take me to, you know, to these venues, you know. I wasn't old enough to really appreciate it, but I remember going to a couple of the venues, and I remember just hanging on to my father's coattail. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't know who Tito Puente was. I didn't know who Celia Cruz was until I was, you know, a little bit older. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But you know, those are my idols. Too. Right? Did you grow up with Amer American style rock soul as well? Well, in my house, I had a variety of music. You know from the Latin music to the jazz music to the heavy Hispanic music, the, you know, the boleros, the plenas, all that. But in my room, behind closed doors, you know, I listened to WC, you know, AM radio, because there was no FM radio. Mm -hmm. So I had a good variety mm -hmm. of stuff. But I appreciated, you know, as I got older, my heritage in music. Mm -hmm. What were the schools you went to like the elementary schools were, uh, do you feel you got a good public school education? Real good, because going to school in the Bronx and being the grandson of one of the biggest <laughs> <laughs> political activists at that time, you know, you know, I went to PS25, 
you know, like, you know, like I said, my mother went to that school, mm -hmm. and that was the first bilingual educated school in the public school system. From there, my uh, junior high school was chosen for me, Clark 149. You know, my mother went to Burger. Okay. Wow. So I graduated from Clark, and then in 77, one of the first brand new academic high schools opened up in, in the Bronx, which was South Bronx High School in St. Anne's. And that was chosen for me too. And I went to <laughs> South Bronx High School, mm -hmm. and I was in the first graduating class mm -hmm. in 1980. And, you know, I gotta be honest, it was a little difficult being the grandson of or the son of going to school because not only did you have two, you had many eyes on me, you know, just because of who I was. Mm -hmm. So I had to meet certain expectations, but it, it worked out well because I was a product of the SP program back at the time. Mm -hmm. I skipped, I went from seventh to ninth grade, you know, and so I got a really good education mm -hmm. program. Now this, you went to Clark Junior High. Yeah. Was Eddie Bonamir, the pianist, still a music teacher there? I don't remember his name, but Vincent Corazon was the, the principal at that time, and a few other good teachers there. Mm -hmm. um, what, were there any kind of gang problems that you had to deal with growing up? <coughs> growing up? No, because I had, I wouldn't say, I mean, my grandmother never shunned or ran away from any community problems. And yes, there were a lot of gang problems at the time. She took in people like Benji Melendez from the Ghetto Brothers, the president of the Ghetto Brothers. She took in people from the Savage Skulls and all these community people. So I knew them growing up. When you say she took them in, she involved she, she involved them in her work and wow. gave them their jobs. Gave them jobs. Mm -hmm. I mean, Benji Melendez, you know, who who had a brigade of, of gang members totaling, you know, a couple of thousand. Will tell anybody today how Evelina Antonetti walked into their gang house, pointed them out, and said, "You want a job? Go home, take a bath, shave, and come see him." And gave him his first job. <laughs> That's great story. But that's how she, she, she wasn't afraid of anybody. Mm. She was doing something for her people in her community. Uh -huh. And the, you shouldn't be afraid of anybody if you're going to uh -huh. do something for mm. them. You know? Now, you, you mentioned when we were talking outside that Ramon Velez, when he began, was different from the Ramon Velez. Well, Ramon Velez did a lot for the South Bronx community. Mm -hmm. You know, he's also referred to the first slum lord of the South Bronx. But, you know, put that aside, he did a lot of good things, you know, in terms of pop, um, property and housing. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a shame that, you know, when you hear nicknames, you know, pop, the first poverty pimp, you know, the South mm -hmm. Bronx. But all in all, Ramon did a lot of good. And, and your grandmother could work with him. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they never, there was times when she they didn't see eye to eye, mm -hmm. but it's like that in, in any type of uh -huh. thing when you you know you have different organizations working together. Mm -hmm. but they pretty much work together. Mm -hmm. Now, um, when did you first become aware of what today we call hip hop? Well, that's what you wanted to get to. You know, I need to go over all my stuff okay. to get to the hip hop. Okay. Okay. We'll do that. You up to 1980 already? I don't know. I want to go. <laughs> okay, <there>. Maxine. <laughs> Come on, Max. <laughs> Thank you. Before you get to the hip hop, you know, can I want to talk to you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anyone. I'm just so impressed. <laughs> I'm sitting next to Dexter Gordon. Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. Well, I'm impressed. Thank you. You, know, you got the pedigree. Um, I want to talk about Tito Puente. Okay. And I'm very interested. How old were you when you first uh, you found the first book you were um, I must have been 10, 11, 12. So what year, what year you bought? Could I you was born in 63. I'm 43 your, years old. Say, could you say your birthday? We should have said it at the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was born Joseph Anthony Conzo. Okay. I'm not really a junior because my father is Joseph Lewis Conzo. But I call myself Junior. Oh, Joe. Mm -hmm. I was born February 6, 1963. Okay. And I was so born in I was born in Flower Fifth House. Flower Fifth House. I'm born in Flower Fifth House. Yeah. You're yeah. not even there. I know. <laughs> My father was in the service at the time, and that was the only hospital that accepted the GI. Yeah. yeah. 
Wow, see? Yeah, you're well, so well. <laughs> But so you were ten. That means it would be like in seventy three. Yeah, right? I remember that. Yeah. So do you know where Tito was working that you went? Uh, it might have like been. In, it might have been. Maybe the course of oh, yeah. eighty six. Uh -huh. First time I met Tito. Uh -huh. So your father took you along to the gig, yeah. uh -huh. and uh, was Sally working with him then? That's a little early, right? No, it was around oh, that time. Uh -huh. yeah. So you knew her yeah. also? I knew of her. You, mm -hmm. you gotta understand something. A 10, 11 year old, we're not really in, you know, we listen to the music that was played in our house, okay? But when we're outside of our house, mm -hmm. we're gonna listen to whatever our peers are listening to. Mm -hmm. So back then, you know, Three Dog Night, you know. Uh -huh. And, and blood, sweat, and tears. You know, like those that. are the stuff. Uh -huh. You know, uh -huh. but I listened to Tito, but I knew who, who he was. And Sayo uh -huh. Cruz, and Machito, and uh -huh. all those people. But your father, how did he become? Do you know the history of how he got became he, associated with? He, like I said, my father was a struggling conga player. Uh huh. And he. Where is he born? He, my father was born in forty three. Oh, okay. Forty three. Uh -huh. And he just. Idolized Tito so much. Uh -huh. and met Tito, I guess, at a gig, and from there, one thing led to another. Uh -huh. Where my father is also one of the foremost music colleges in the world. He has his record collection, you know, outweighs anybody. Wow. You know, they call where is it? In your house. Oh, in yeah. his house, but probably gonna end up in my yeah. house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we want to see his record what? collection. Uh -huh. But um. People call my father when they need to know history. Uh-huh. And, you know, he could tell you everything about Tito, Machito, and yeah. everybody. Wow. Everybody. Actually, yeah. But... <laughs> <it's a laughs> <library number. laughs> sure. Uh -huh. Tito somebody, Rodriguez? Tito Rodriguez, Junior, all of them. Uh -huh. All of them. Uh -huh. okay. But I guess my father met Tito probably at a gig uh -huh. back in the 50s, early 60s, and struck up a friendship. And... One thing led to another, you know, that was a 40 year, 50 year right. friendship. Yeah. Did he travel with him to Europe? Everywhere. Yeah, I know your father. Everywhere. I know. Tell him to, to tell okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll tell him yeah. myself. But yeah, <laughs> I, now I know because yeah. um, in the jazz festival so, in yeah, Europe, yeah. you know, the Tito Point yeah. and Sally were on yeah. the same bill with Dexter yeah. and Miles yeah. and everything yeah. because. In Europe, as you found out probably about oh, your please. photos, they don't separate into these no. little categories. But they so love us in Europe oh. so much more than our own country. Well, and my dad, I mean, please, Latin people love Latin people. Yeah, but, you know, my dad also told me, it's like, my dad, you know, I, I asked my dad one day, why do I have to go to London in Europe to show my first gallery show? And he goes, well, Tito was bigger in Europe yeah. than he was here. <clears throat> Mm. You know, and it's same with all the jazz. Celia stuff. Cruz was the most popular star in Finland. She she's like a, the a, you know the queen of like pop music mm. in Finland. I mean, so go figure, right? <laughs> so you know, it's you no, know, it's a great response. It was huge. Mm -hmm. So, did you ever get to go out of the country? No, like I mostly you know I played. I went and took pictures of. Tito Machito's bands playing together at the Boston Symphony, uh -huh. which was like 70-something. When was did you begin uh, as a photographer? I began photography in junior high school, oh. in Clark Junior High School. They had a course I was or something? Or? Pretty much, yeah, an extracurricular course. I was a school photographer. Uh -huh. Then I became the high school school photographer. But photography, you know, I was a chubby little kid. Big Afro, you know, and I played sports, but I wasn't good enough to be, you know, that all-school basketball oh. player or football. And photography was my gateway, my huh. to meeting and documenting my community. Mm. And girls love having. Oh, that's right. <laughs> 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 you know, uh, it's either music, sports, or you found yeah. photography. That's so, cool. and photography was my art form. Uh -huh. And I just took my camera everywhere. What kind of camera? I started out with a Minolta. Minolta SRT 200. No flip. The photos on your website of uh, Celia Machito and all, what are they taking with? My Minolta. That same camera? Yeah. Very good. Thank yeah. you.
I like those. So then did, you, did it become sort of a job? No, you, it was my hobby. It was my hobby. Even the ones of the Machito and all that, did they, they, were they my use for publicity or no, anything? No, no. It was you just, never were commercial? I didn't know how. I didn't know to market how them. to market them. I just liked taking pictures. You know, my dad would use them, you know, some years later, you know, Tito would put out a CD or stuff. And you know. say you got my dad that. would write the liner yeah. notes and, oh, my son Joe has this beautiful picture. You know, Sony said, sure, put him. Give Joe 100 bucks. Uh -huh. You know, that's how I did CD covers for Tito and stuff like that. But um, he's, anything outside of that, you know, I didn't know how to market, you know. But um, the first picture I ever had published in the newspaper was the New York Post. And that was a Paul Newman chasing me away. Cause I, was, I saw that photo. Yeah. That's a famous photo. During uh, his uh, Fort Apache the Bronx. It's a famous photo yeah. when he looks so mean. Yeah. Because yeah. he was photographing yeah. the, on the set. Yeah. And they didn't want the set photographed. Yeah. Uh, mm. yeah. So, uh, and who would think 30 years later, 35 years later, my archives are so much in demand. The, um, before we get to the uh -oh. uh, I, I did <laughs> see in, uh, in the article that you fell on like tough times. Oh yeah, uh, can we I talk about sure that? And, uh, and tell, and I wanted you to tell a story about the negatives and how they were saved. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'll just come to the point. I've been yes. clean and sober 14 years now. Yeah, that's good. And my father also nice. been clean and sober. 27 years, but, um, yeah. <laughs> please, I can tell you stories, no, no, okay. <laughs> um, like so many of my people in the community, you know, they fell on hard times, I fell on hard times, I was introduced to drugs through peers, and, you know, my dad had a history of, of drugs, and so I knew to stay away from him to a point, okay, because I remember my dad bringing me to shooting galleries and seeing how oh, really? high. Oh, yeah. so you really... Oh, yeah. You know, and it's a vicious cycle that happens it, in our community. I just want to, I don't mean to interrupt, but I want to ask you something. What, did you, what do you mean when you say you, I was raised by Dominicans? My... How much is it? Mother Oh, mother. Or your right. stepmother. During... Because when my mother my raised five time. of us uh -huh. by herself. Uh -huh. So while she was at work, she hired a, a woman oh, to yeah, come take... Yeah, so. Yeah. I don't know yeah, if madrata is a good word no, for no, but, uh, a nanny, but I don't know how to. Yeah. Uh -huh. So a caretaker. Or a caretaker. Yeah. So this woman okay. who was Dominican didn't speak a word of English raised us oh. while my mother worked. I see. Okay. And you know, she was known as Titi. Uh -huh. Also, uh -huh. Titi also. So I mean, I got to eat mango, or some oh, yeah. the, the that's camarones. That's like auntie. Yeah, and we have that. And so that's, that's how you know when I when I tell people they ask me my yeah, background. I said I'm Puerto Rican, part Cuban, part Italian, and raised by Americans. Okay. I just wanted to make that point. <laughs> now go back to the drugs. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot, you know, I fell. I got introduced to drugs during high school. You know, started marijuana. And gradually and drugs for me were pretty much a recreational thing for me hip-hop scene disco scene where we used to go out dancing you know we pulled together our little money and buy whatever was on the menu that day mm -hmm. it wasn't until i experienced death for the first time in my life and that was the passing of my grandmother mm. who had raised us who was so dear to me i cannot that was a pain that I could not fathom, and I turned to drugs. What year is that? She died? She died in 83. 83. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's when I fell on hard times. Mm -hmm. And I turned to drugs to hide from the pain that I was going through. And that's what a lot of my people turn to drugs to, to hide from the despair and pain that they're going through. So when that happened, you know, it was just all downhill from there. You know, passing of, you know, my grandmother, you know, one thing led to another. I lost my job. I was working at Lincoln Hospital as a clerk in the emergency room. I lost my apartment. I was given an ultimatum by my father to join the army and go to St. Raymond's. I was like, what St. Raymond's? You know, yeah, St. Raymond's Cemetery, because yeah. that's where I'm going to put you at <laughs> if you don't 
you know, get your act together. So I joined the army. Because my father joining, you know, went to the army too to get away from his drug problems. Okay. So in the army, I stopped doing drugs, but I started drinking. You pick up one thing and it's another. So after like almost five years in the army, you know, working as a, a nurse, a medical person, I knew when the drug tests were being given because I used to give them. Uh, so, um,. I had, you know, started getting high again in the service, and one day I was home, <coughs> Memorial Day weekend, got high, went back, and at 4.30 in the morning, my entire company got this test, and I got kicked out the army. <gasps> so, fine. so I came back here, struggled, I was married at the time, had my first son. I struggled a lot, you know, from job to job, you know, went through a divorce, and it wasn't until I got arrested for the first yeah. time in oh my, my life. You gotta understand something. My family background, very political, very outgoing. My dad, Tito, and all that. You know, I had a standard to live up to, so to speak. You know, okay. and it was embarrassing. I've always worked, and never, you know, I never was homeless or anything like that. But with drugs, <laughs> it's just a progression. I don't care what kind of job you, you have. What you know, uh -huh. you do for a living, eventually, drugs will get over. Uh -huh. uh -huh. So that's what happened to me. I became homeless, I was living in the street, uh -huh. got arrested for the first time in my life, and that's when I just threw up my hands and said, you know what, enough is enough. You know, I surrender to God. And I spent 18 months in the drug facility in the States. Mm. And through the grace of God, you know, I dealt with a lot of family, problems, family issues, other issues, a lot of baggage, so to speak, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and it was unfortunate. That's it, good. Yeah. Wow. And so well, are you working now for, yeah? You know, I work for the New York City Fire Department. Uh -huh. I'm a paramedic there for the last That's excellent. about 14 years, and you should see me preaching in the back of the ambulance yeah, right. when I pick up, you know, overdoses and wow. homeless people. Excellent. So I preach to them, and I send them to my mother to get help. Really? Her oh, she, what's her program? She's United right. Bronx Parents. She oh. runs a drug rehab for women with children. Excellent. I'm her best referral. Oh mm -hmm. my god. Huh? Well, that's something. Um, and let me. So, the photos of that. And let me ask you about the being a young guy <coughs> on the Latin scene of the older musicians. You know how? <clears throat> tell me about the audience. Tell me about the court the, yeah. It was alive. Yeah. So vibrant. I mean, Latin music is so vibrant so alive you know the scene was just incredible being young you know seeing this happen it's just amazing mm -hmm. beautiful flamboyant you know mm -hmm. I, i'm very interested in like the this african-american latino cross and cultural cross you know the black audience so-called black audience for latino music and african-americans playing not speaking spanish playing not speak well, he, he, Mm -hmm. Even for the, some Caucasian people playing, Diary Rogers didn't speak a uh -huh, word of Spanish. Right. Yeah, we know about that. It was one of the biggest. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You were Barry? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. No, uh, Bobby Porcelli? Bobby Porcelli, all of them. Jose Madera, all of them. Uh huh. Of them. Mm -hmm. Because those, that was my playground, hanging with my dad, knowing all of these musicians who played with Tito and you know, all these other people. Did they get on you about the drugs? No, because I was probably doing drugs with them. Oh, oh really? Yeah, not, you good. Can, not good, but you gotta understand some, you know, the music scene back then ruined, drugs ruined a lot of musicians' yeah. lives because yeah. drugs were so integrated into the music mm -hmm. era. Mm -hmm. At least the time that, you know, mm -hmm. I was in. And, you know, there was a lot of drug usage. Mm -hmm. You know, from your common musician up to your biggest band leader. You, know. you see any conspiracy theory around that bro who brought the drugs in, who made the money on the drugs, or you 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 don't go for that. You know how some people say they were brought well, in. Listen, I have heard so many mm -hmm. different conspiracy this, that and the other. You don't go for it. I don't listen. Mm -hmm. You had a choice back then. Mm -hmm. And if you chose to get high then you chose to get high. Mm -hmm. you know? 
I can relate why you would make those choices, but ultimately, mm -hmm. we all had choices. Yeah. It just was so prevalent. It was just really, really of, of the people you grew up with. Um, did a large percentage get involved? Yeah, it was in my community. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. You know, there was exceptions to rules. You know, out of like let's say five of my best friends. I was probably the only one that really got heavily involved in it, but uh, the five of us used to be high on it. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You know, and we all came from good, you know, family backgrounds. You know, one of my best friends, his mother was, is Carmen Arroyo, one of the, uh -huh. the first, you know, Hispanic woman elected to office. Mm -hmm. You know, but you know, he didn't get it. Just, you know, yeah. as much as I'm, I'm very interested in how your father became a writer when you used to describe him as a failed Congo player. And he's writing articles for the Starga, right? He, I mean, that was his love. Latin music was his love. Tito, you know, the joke with our family is well, my father's been married five times. Oh. Legally. <laughs> But he's been married to, but never divorced Tito. That was uh -huh. his first time. Uh -huh. uh -huh. yeah. They were inseparable. Inseparable. Uh -huh. yeah. I mean, if you I said, oh, tomorrow, you know, we're interviewing Joe Conso Jr. Oh, Tito. Oh, I, oh yeah. Oh, that little kid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, and he was just a plethora of information, my father, and, you know, wrote with like, liner notes, wrote this, would tell. He could tell you stuff about Tito that Tito didn't know. <laughs> I mean, whenever people wanted something from Tito, Tito would say, go see Joe. Uh -huh. Go see Joe. The book started happening, the albums, and this, that, and the other. And next thing you know, my father is just the, the person who was it. Uh -huh. So tell us what happened with the negatives. Okay. I had what's called some lost years. Uh -huh. And my lost years were due to my drug usage. So from about 77... When I picked up my camera, I documented everything. The birth of hip hop, my, you know, me hanging out with my dad and Tito and Celia. My grandmother had various demonstrations across the city wow. and, you know, city hall and stuff. But around 82, 83, I stopped taking pictures because I was too busy chasing the drug. And I pick up, you know, late 80s, early 90s when I picked up the camera. But, being a drug addict, the camera, you know, I sold all my camera equipment, I sold everything, because, you know, your first thing is trying to get drugs. My mother saved my negatives and held on to them for all these right? years. <laughs> He's a lucky guy, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, then, did she pull them out, or did you ask her what happened to them? How, how is this, it, like, re... You know, I got clean. Uh -huh. I started getting back into photography. You know, I finally stayed, got you know, a stabilized home. You know, I wasn't living from house to house. You know, after my divorce and after knowing me, I went back home and lived with moms and with my brother. But, you know, after a few years of sobriety, you know, I started building a foundation and you know, make a phone call. Hey, remember when I left this over there a few years ago? You still have it? Sure, come on, pick it up. And I just started collecting my negatives again. You know, AD from the Cold Crush Brothers had a bunch of my black oh, and white negatives. Really? Joe, I still have them. Gave them all back to me. Isn't mm -hmm. that, you're very lucky yeah. because you know these stories but where people lose. I'm blessed. I'm not yeah, lucky. Yeah, I'm yeah. blessed. Mm -hmm. I should have been dead years ago. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? With the stuff that I've done and this, that, and I'm blessed. You know, I was almost killed in 9 11. You, know, you were down there? Yeah. Working? I was in the Maria evacuating people when the first tower fell down. Okay. And I was buried alive for about a good half an hour, 45 minutes. Oh my God. And came out, first person I called was my mother, hysterical, and she's saying, shut up, blank, blank, blank up, get the blank, blank out of there. I'm like, Ma, I can't leave, I gotta find my partner and stuff. She goes, well, you find your partner, get out of there. Well, make a long story short, I stood down there for the next 24 hours, did what I can do it. But I'm blessed, man. Oh, yeah. are you okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But God forbid I should leave this earth tomorrow. I've been blessed with mm. a legacy, and you know I have a lot to contribute. You have um, ever had an exhibition of the Latin photos? 
Small ones, uh-huh. small ones. While my Born in the Bronx exhibit was in, in oh. London, this is really huge. I had a smaller one in London at, at a small venue there, which was well received. Mm-hmm. And um, like I told you, you know, I just signed my first book deal with Rizzoli Books mm-hmm. for the hip hop stuff. And as soon as that's done, they're going to sign, do another book on my Latin stuff. Oh, so very good. Um, so could you, all right, now we can move into this. How did this association begin with the hip hop? And then Mark will ask. Well, you um, um, I went to high school. I went to South Bronx High School. And I was a school photographer there. Okay? South Bronx High School is the home of Adrian Harris, a.k.a. A.D., and um, Angelo King, a.k.a. Tony Tone who Tony was just putting together uh, his own hip-hop group called the Cold Crush Brothers, okay? They, now, I was the school photographer, so I was taking pictures of A.D., who was also a school star basketball player, oh. and they invited me to take pictures of this group that they were putting together. Now, mind you, I'm, in dis- I'm into disco. You're <laughs> talking 77, 78. Okay. I'm into disco, you know? So I went along thinking that Maybe I can make a couple of dollars taking pictures. And one thing led to another. I started following them on all their venues, and uh, we started distributing my photos to the crowds, using my photos on flyers. And wow. I became the official photographer. Mm-hmm. I was, as a matter of fact, they were the only group that had their own photographer. Yeah, they knew that they were. You pretty much, like they had an idea about much. how popular. Some of them will. Get. Some of them will tell you today. That they knew. They had the epiphany thing. Thirty years later, this would all be. I didn't know. I just love taking pictures. <laughs> so, you didn't have an idea that this was something new that was going to sweep the world. I had no idea. Now, don't get me wrong. They were very popular and very you know. I love telling people I'm with the band, you know, I'm with them, because, you know, when you're with the band, you can get into yeah, anything. Like <laughs> yeah, 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 you I'm with the band. I'm with the band. I said that last night. You know, the girls. I'm with and the band. band. Yeah. Uh-huh. And it was nice. You know, and then when Rapper's Delight came out, it was like, wow, this is going to be big. Mm-hmm. You know, and the Cold Crush did a few albums, The Weekend, Punk Rap, Punk Rock right, Rap. Right. And yeah. I've got all those. Uh, Fresh Fly, yeah. All Them Bowls, you know. What, what, what? They never made it commercially as big as Rappers Delight, but you know, but hanging out with them, I got to meet and photograph uh-huh. Cool Herc, Africa Bambana, the Trump uh-huh. Street, oh, yeah. you know, all these, you know, Curtis Blow, all these pioneering foundation laying people. Right. What was the, the sort of cultural, social scene between blacks and Latinos in your community when so you were growing up. We were all integrated. Uh-huh. We were all integrated. And that was in elementary school, elementary, junior high? Elementary, junior high, high school. We were all, I mean, you had your social class where, you know, you know the blacks were on one side, but when it came to, to, to hanging out, having a good time or whatever, you know, sporting events, whatever, it was all integrated. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was Cool Herc like in those days? Very tall, <laughs> very heavy Jamaican accent, and very to himself. You know, very innovative. You know, he had the foresight to see. And, you know, very... <sighs> I'm trying to look for a word where, you know, people were afraid because he's such a tall guy. He was lovable once you get to know him. Mm-hmm. Did you have any contact with with Flash in those days? Somewhat. I didn't. You know, you gotta understand too. Since I didn't have the foresight of seeing where this would go, I could be around Flash and not will care who he was because I was too busy taking pictures of right. Cold Crush uh-huh. and whoever passed through their circle. Right. The majority of my archives is of the Cold Crush, the Treacherous Three, because there was an alliance back then, you know, right. Cool Her, Curtis right. Blow, Flash was like a rival to the Cold Crush Brothers, even mm-hmm. though they played in the same venue, uh-huh. you know, I didn't care about Flash. 
Did you take any outdoor jams? Uh, yeah. uh, some, some, some and some jams. how did how did they hook up the sound system? The light poles. Uh -huh. That's where they drew their electricity from. Mm. They just unscrew the unscrew the plate. You know, you get your local electrician, you know, flock on the corner. <laughs> <laughs> the green wire with the green wire, and hopefully you will get electrocuted. Uh, hopefully. Yeah. Uh -huh. What's the name of the um, bus driver that Brian and I met? Uh, uh, cool Clyde. You know, I heard you met Cool Clyde, yes. Like cool Clyde, he yes. recognized Brian when we got on the bus. Yeah. Uh -huh. Cool Clyde's a good guy. Driving a bus for 13 years. Well, look at him. City, we all became city workers. Right? You know, That's very interesting. AD from the Coal Crush runs the Harlem YMCA for the last 13 mm -hmm. years also. Wow. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a paramedic with the fire department. Mm -hmm. And pretty much you go around and you can pretty much see, you know, a lot of the pioneers are doing a lot of different things. Joe Batan. Joe Batan works at Spa for the okay. last 20 years. One Did of my idols. Could you say something about Joe Batan? Joe Batan. And it's a it, funny story. Um, when I became a teenager, I loved his music. And growing up when I got married, I mean, you name it. Gypsy Woman to, you know, just any one of them. And I used to tell this to my dad. Oh, Joe. Yeah. They went to school together. Oh. I didn't know that. Yeah, and one day I'll introduce him. You know, my father's from Raspy, but I'll introduce you to him. And it's always, I've never met him. Last year was the first time I met Joe Batan. Mm -hmm. And we have struck up such a good friendship. We email each other, we go to concerts together, and everything. Mm -hmm. He is such a cool dynamite. And he's another pioneer of, of another genre of music that never got his just dues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who, who, Latin soul. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. yeah. Who who else uh, I know this, but who else is in that group that was popular? Uh, in Johnny Cologne, yeah, right. I mean Joe Cuba, uh -huh. you, you name it. Uh -huh. I mean that's a Joe genre. Of, yeah, that's a genre of music that really does don't get the just dues also. Which I relate to hip hop also. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm very interested also, you know, about talking about that genre. Okay. Yeah. Please. He's so down. The you road. know, that relates to something that happened in jazz where you then you go to like what they call soul jazz. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Latin blacks, you know, wanting to make their voices heard. You mm -hmm. know, at that time too, you know, late seventies, early eighties, you know, the Bronx was burning, drugs were rampant, gangs were prevalent all over the city. You know, and these were just some youth trying to do their own thing. Mm -hmm. And as far as being, you know, coached by any other people, I really don't know because even though I was there, my thing was not the music itself. Right. I was documenting it. Yeah. But um, this is a very famous picture. Yeah, it is. This is uh, a picture you, of could you, could you talk about that? the Cold Crush Brothers performing at my junior, my high school prom, at South wow. Bronx High School. This so many this picture appeared in the Chris Rock movie CB4 oh, that's right. that's in the right. beginning of the film. No film credit, no payment, <gasps> no nothing. So who imagine, who knows? So imagine, I mean, we used to give out hundreds of pictures during the show. So oh. imagine my surprise, I'm sitting in the movie theater and, you know, seeing my picture on a 30 by 40 foot screen. And it says, photo by Joey. Oh. You know? That is your name? On the the picture itself, but I got no credit, no, no, nothing. But this is a very famous picture. So could you tell who's in it and where okay, it is? Okay, this is the Cold Crush Brothers, Cold Crush 4. You have the Almighty KG, Easy AD, Charlie Chase, Tony Tone, JDL, and Grandmaster Kaz, who wrote Rappers Delight. Right. Who never got credit for it or anything like that. And this is at your high school? South Bronx High School. Yeah. high school. 701 East Right. right. Tell the story about uh, Grandmaster Kaz and uh, well, Rappers Delight. Grandmaster Kaz, um, Cold Crush Brothers, when they were pretty much. Joe, could you show us some family pictures and explain okay. what they are? This is a, something I did myself. It's a, a, I thought. It's a picture of my grandmother, Evelyn Antonetti, and my mother, taken about 25 years apart, but the sim similarities, oh. the similarities are so unique, I, you know, did something on my computer, and I put them together. Oh, it's a real picture of them together, oh wow, yeah. how great. Um, this is a picture from a demonstration on Prospect Avenue with the, the banner from my grandmother's organization that she started, United Bronx Parents which my mother, Lorraine Montenegro, still runs today. This is a picture of, of the opening ceremony of La Casita. La Casita is the first drug rehab for women with children in the nation. Mm -hmm. Years ago, her mother had a drug problem. She had kids. She would literally have to give her kids up for adoption to enter a drug rehab. My mother opened up the first of its kind. Subsequently, later on, Mother Hale did the same thing and got more famous. What is the address of this building? This is 833, uh, 156th Street, something like that? Uh, yeah. Uh, the old the Sports for the People, the people. building. Uh -huh. um, right. And in this picture, you have Gov Governor Cuomo there. You have a picture I took from my grandmother in the background. But this is... And this is a black and white picture of my mother, my grandmother at her office at 810 East 156th Street, 52nd Street, an old factory that she took over. My grandmother was good for taking over stuff <laughs> that Are nobody those else wanted. Are those all over the walls? Uh, some of them might uh -huh. be. Uh -huh. um, my mother, my grandmother's like, you know, took these buildings from the city give them a dollar for a year for rent and she renovate them and make them into community organizations. Oh. Um, that's basically it. Show the proclamation. This is a proclamation from June 1985. My grandmother died in 83. But this is in June of 1985 where Governor Cuomo gave a proclamation and named the open space of the first multi-million dollar building the Bronx had seen in a long time, Fordham, the Fordham Complex. There. It's right across the street from, from the university. university. Mm. Evelina Antonetti Plaza, yeah. but there's no plaque 
Uh, they never put a plaque there. So it, there's no street sign or anything? Nothing. Nothing. Oh, so you could fix it? I yeah, plan I'm to. Hoping. He, he's that would be <laughs> awesome. Runs in the footsteps of your grandmother. That would be <laughs> awesome. <laughs> And that's basically it. Some newspaper articles, but... Uh, mm -hmm. Now, uh, something you said before uh, really rang a bell, because we've interviewed several people from the St. Mary's houses. Did you watch the Bronx burn before your eyes? I lived it. you got to understand something. You know, 555 Cornwell Avenue. Okay. Surrounded by abandoned buildings. Once a week, there would be a fire in there or another building. We were on first name basis with the firemen that used to come. Because that's how many fires were in the Bronx oh. during those times. <coughs> you know, my mother used to open the window, you want some coffee? <laughs> you want some this? But, it, you know, the, the Bronx was burnt, the Bronx burnt before my eyes. And, you know, there's so many different reasons why landlords wanted to collect insurance, mm -hmm. drive the Hispanics and the blacks out of the Bronx. You know, just so many different things. But, you know, that was a big thing. Do you think that would have, it, it, on some subconscious level, an effect on young people growing up in that environment? Of course it did. Of course it did. When your entire neighborhood is ravaged by fires and drugs and everything, of course it does. Mm -hmm. I was just fortunate enough and blessed that, you know, that there were some family values in my upbringing. Mm -hmm. You know, even though I did stray the path and was a drug addict for a little while, you know, mm -hmm. of course all of that. Your, your environment definitely has an effect on you. Mm -hmm. uh, so... In your neighborhood, most of the tenements burned. Of course. And it was the public housing that w held up. That held up, yeah. You don't see too many projects right. burning. It's the smaller right. tenements. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Was St. Mary's houses always well kept, well preserved? Pretty much, from what I can remember. Mm -hmm. From what I can remember. You know, also, too, you know, during that time, I was also, you know, my mother remarried for the second time. We moved from the Bronx to Manhattan, across the street from Columbia University. Mm -hmm. My stepfather taught at Columbia, where he was getting his doctorate at the time. So I went from the slums, you know, the, the, the Bronx to, you know, the radical movement of Columbia University in that area. Mm -hmm. During the late sixties and early seventies, and but you were still going to school in the Bronx. In the Bronx, yeah. Uh huh. I also did two years in Agnes Russell in Columbia University, their mm -hmm. private school. You know, um, we also lived in Chevy Chase, Maryland, for a little while. You know, house, picket fence. You know, uh. nice. You know, but when she divorced him, it was back to the <laughs> South Bronx. Uh. <laughs> 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 what a Was culture shock. shock. What? <laughs> so there were five of you? There's my mother raised, I have four brothers. There's five of us all together. Right. Four brothers and uh -huh. sisters. And did all of you go to Chevy Chase? Yeah. <laughs> Where she goes, you go, right? That's right. That's right. Uh huh. But basically, I was born and raised in the Bronx. Yeah, right. I lived outside and then, for a little time. And then you went back to St. Mary's. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> Not the project itself, right across the street, 555 Cordwell. Cordwell on 49th Street, which is right across from the same marriage project. Mm -hmm. But I was born in, in those projects, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, what is your recollection of the 80s? That was a tough time. <laughs> the 80s were a big blur to me. Uh -huh. Not really. I mean, listen, I graduated from high school in the 80s, in 1980. I worked freelance for a photographer for two years after high school. Mm -hmm. You know, I was exposed to the business of photography. Down, I worked for a fine arts photographer downtown. Uh -huh. We used to go to galleries and you know, all over photographing, you know, artwork worth hundreds and hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of dollars. And I worked for him. I was his assistant. I did two years at School of Visual Arts down on Twenty Third Street. You know all while taking pictures and building my archives. 
but also getting deeper and deeper into, into mm-hmm. drugs. Mm-hmm. So the, the 80s were a good year, but it was also a hard year for me because, you know, 83, 84 is, you know, began right. my lost years. So yeah. Speak. Now, in, when, when you, it seems like women were the ones who held the community together. It, would that be fair to say? It, it, well, from my background, it is fair to say. My mother raised five of us on her own. Two failed marriages, but kept us together. Mm. My grandmother, you know, ran one of the largest and longest running community organizations. Mm-hmm. She was still married at the time, but, you know, my grandfather took, you know, a step in the background. You know, he ran, my grandmother opened up a daycare center, and he ran that. But the uh-huh. political front lines, that was my grandmother's thing. She would Do you think there was any kind of culture clash for people coming from Puerto Rico to New York in terms of women playing a larger role? Women have always, and this is just my perspective, women have always played a large role in a family upbringing. Because the, the men were too busy going out making a living to support. You know, a lot of them would take jobs in the service, traveling, you know. Uh-huh. So, to me, you know, the women had those roles of, of, of role models and stuff. But in the opening, you know, it's the machismo of the Latin man that saying, you know, I'm the breadwinner, I'm the this, you know, but to me, the women have always mm-hmm. held that strong role. Right. But here is your grandmother, who's not only a leader in the family, she's a major force. She in the was the matriarch of our family. But of also the whole neighbor. The community, too. Uh-huh. Did, did, how did the male leaders respond? They had to respect her because she had no problem in cursing you out or, 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 or causing you bottom line. Bottom line. <laughs> bottom line. <laughs> My grandmother was arrested numerous times because she had no problem cursing a cop out when just beat up one of, you know, from, you know beating up a, a little kid. Uh-huh. She had no problem taking garbage down to the steps of City Hall and dumping it there and saying, have your kids like that. Uh, Brian should hear that. Have like Core, Brooklyn Core, remember? Yeah. I wonder if they got that from who knows if, who did that first. Yeah. They, that was, they, know, they all know each other. Yeah, because that was, remember yeah. that when they did that in Brooklyn? Yeah. Yeah, that but was she so had no Everybody in New York knew who Evelina uh-huh. and Eddie was if you're an activist. I don't care if you're in Brooklyn, Queens. Uh-huh. True. I'm going to have True. Yeah. But um, she had no problem, and because these are her people, you know. Were you brought up with uh, consciousness of Puerto Rican history? Yeah. And uh, very, very important in our family. Very important. You know, even though we were living in Puerto Rico, in our family, we had to know our history. You know. Especially the political history. You know. uh-huh. Pedro Abuso Campos. <laughs> Lita Lebron, mm-hmm. you know, when all of those political prisoners were released, um, mm-hmm. were pardoned by Carter, I think. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure who pardoned them after right. 27 years. Uh-huh. One of the first places they came to was the Bronx to see my grandmother. Oh. I have pictures of Lolita Lebron wow. and my grandmother. Mm-hmm. Oscar Coliasso, Rafael Hernandez, mm-hmm. all released from prison coming to the Bronx to see my grandmother. Mm-hmm. Wow. Did she work for their release since she was yeah. uh, on that committee? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, so did, was she pro independence? Yeah, of course. Of course. Uh-huh. No. Uh, <laughs> did, you, did your family have any relationship with Santa Maria? It depends on what part of the family you spoke to. <laughs> it was respected. Let's just put it that way. It mm-hmm. was respected because it is part of your culture. Mm-hmm. It is part of your culture. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say my grandmother was the biggest church-going person there was. Mm -hmm. She respected the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, my mother respected, you know, our culture of Santeria, Bougainé, and all that. Mm -hmm. So, you know. And Tito Puente, you know, had a lot of men. Big time. Big time. You know, that, since you're asking, you know, African religion, all the religions of the... 
especially in Puerto Rico, is all over the Latin music scene. Mm -hmm. He's deeply involved in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he'd go like that. And, you know, yes. everywhere. People thought he was just... Yeah, uh, right. No, the, everything yeah. means something. He's, he's doing he's, something. He's do that, you know. And Candida last night, too, you know. Uh, that must, I wish that I was, known about it. You know, they take that. He took yeah. that. He paid homage, okay. so. Now, okay. can you pause a second? Let me yeah. change this. But okay. your father, he wasn't in the village. Huh? Your father didn't practice. He was in the village. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, he didn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well. <laughs> Next, we'll show the hip-hop pictures. And uh, this, is, this is great that you still have this. We, you know, we love we love this kind of uh, memory, as you can see from the you article ready? in yeah. the Times. You know. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Joe, could you show us through some of the amazing hip hop photos and memorabilia well, that you've accumulated? This is yeah. this is a catalog. I just returned from overseas from London, where myself and my good friend Johan. Kugelberg, who is a Swedish uh, gentleman who loves hip hop. Hip hop. From Sweden. <laughs> Get out of here. And he, he put together my first exhibit. And it was called Born in the Bronx, or is called Born in the Bronx. How did he find you? Same way Mark found me. To that article in Just, the Times? No, no. We've known each other for about two years now. But through Grandmaster Kaz, and you know, he's a collector. He collects old records and oh. stuff. So one phone call after another, I got introduced. Okay. He says, "I love your work. It should be an exhibit. Let's do it." So this is a catalog. It's a visual record of rap's early days, and um, it's three catalogs. One catalog is of my photos. That's a shoe, by the way. Yeah, this is me. This is a self-portrait <laughs> I did of myself for for school. Oh, oh. so cool. When I was thin and a half old. <laughs> yeah. And this is um, a kid from the neighborhood, Boo Boo. This is 149th Street and Park Avenue. Um, the Maria Lopez houses are built there now, but they weren't built there at the time. And we used to, this was our playground, you know, open lots. And here's some pictures of some of my early pictures of my hip hop. Kumo D and Grandmaster Class, you know, two of the greatest MCs ever. You know, Easy A D and DJ Tony Tone. You do your own printing? At that time I did. You did. I had my own dark room. My mother says, if it's gonna keep you off the streets, take one of our extra bathrooms and make a dark room. You had a dark room in the St. Mary's houses? No, in Michelangelo. In Michelangelo? Yeah. Right. You know, the abandoned buildings were so prevalent at that time. They were all over. Mm -hmm. you know, this is one of the first pictures of the Cold Crush Brothers performing together at the Tea Connection, which was on White Plains and uh, mm -hmm. Gun Hill. Right. Cool Herc, the father of hip hop, and DJ Tony Tone. This was at the Tea Connection. This was at a club downtown called The Grills. And The Grills was one of the first clubs, you know, about that, right? <laughs> the Grills was one of the first clubs to allow hip hop to come downtown, because hip hop basically was concentrated up in the Bronx. And Cool Lady Blue, the producer promoter, was instrumental in bringing hip hop downtown. Where was Negrills? Grills? Grills, First Avenue and 18th Street, uh -huh. something like that. I'm not sure. Self portrait of me, <laughs> me and my Angela Davis Afro. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Picture of Chief Rocker Busy B at the Bronx River uh, Community Center on one of the Zulu Nation anniversaries. Mm. This is one of the early pictures of him. And what's so good about this picture is the fashion, you know, the British uh -huh. walkers, the pea coats. Um, DJ Tony Tone at the T Connection. Um, Cole Crush Brothers performing at my prom, South Bronx High School. This is the Cold Crush Brothers at Harlem World. Harlem World is a very famous venue in Harlem on 116th Street. It started out as a disco and, you know, transformed into different things. But what makes this picture so great is the mural in the background. This is the famous UFO mural in Harlem World. A lot of rappers today sing about Harlem World, but weren't even old enough to get in. Yeah. 
This is a picture of KG and King Mario Disco King Mario. May he rest in peace. One of the pioneers of uh, hip hop, also. And just some various other pictures, you know. JDO lighting up. Smoking. Cold Crush Brothers performing on stage. Um, this is a picture of Master Rob and Kevy Kev. This was the rehearsal for the movie Wild Styles. And this was shot on Wire oh, yeah. Avenue and um, 180th. Mm -hmm. And Charlie Ahern today, who directed Wild Styles, who did Wild Styles, she's blown away with some of my photos. Oh, okay. Yeah, because that was just a rehearsal that day from the famous basketball scene. Right, I remember that. This is a picture of the Colchris Brothers at Boys Club, on oh, Hole Avenue Boys Club. This is KG. Like I said, my photos, we used to make, I used to do 8 by 10s of them and we used to throw them out to the crowd. <laughs> it's him throwing out some posters of my pictures and stuff. Wow. And the band would pay to make the copies as a promotion? I would do it and yeah. I would charge them like a dollar per picture. So if I blew up 50 pictures that day for that show, I'd collect $50 from, from the guys. And they gave them away. And we'd it's give them Very, up. very smart. Oh, yeah. I mean, listen, the Cold Crush Brothers were so innovative. I mean, they used smoke machines. And we're talking 1980, 81. Mm. They had Tape Master. Tape Master was a chubby Puerto Rican kid that taped all of their oh, shows 30 years later. And, and we still have them with Troy Smith. Smith. Yeah, and you still have copies of them. You know, I photograph all their shows. Very advanced. You know, not Grandmaster Flash, not the Sugar Hill, not nobody else can can boast all of that. Uh -huh. This is a picture of Tony Tone with Africa Bambara and Busy B. This is the Treacherous Three, who were really close with the Coldridge Brothers. Cool Mo D, L.A. Sunshine, oh, Special K. Mm -hmm. Cool Mo D is a big Hollywood actor. Now. Oh, yes. This is the famous battle between the Cold Crush Brothers and the Fantastic <gasps> Romantic. And they dressed up as gangsters <laughs> with toy guns. This is before gangster rap. Okay, we're talking 1980. Gangster rap came out in the early 90s. And they actually dressed up as gangsters. And this is a shot of a girl who named, I forget, in Cretona Park. So when I'm United Bronx Parents Summer Festival. Mm. Mm. So yeah. this is a book of my photographs. And uh, that that's the catalog for the show? Yeah, this whole thing is a show. And, but then where was the show? In London. In a gallery? Yeah. And gallery. you did the prints or they had the prints? They did all they did everything. Wow. They just flew me over there and it was nice, right? Yeah. And this is uh, a these book of flyers. Hold these up. These are original flyers. You know, hip hop didn't have radio airplay at that time or money to advertise, so they used to do flyers. And Buddy Esquire, who is known as the king of the flyers, used to do flyers. And a lot of the flyers have used my pictures mm. to promote shows. So that was Did another. Did you have these? Huh? You, you this is part these? of Johan's collection. Wow. So. Wow. And, you know, he has one of the largest collections. So this is um, mm -hmm. the flyer collection that's traveling with my... Um, Bronx High School of Science yeah. presents Graham. Yes. <laughs> so these flyers are traveling with my photos. Wow. And we'll be in Japan and... Going to Japan? Yeah, in oh, August. How great! I've never been there. This is so great. All in well. Yeah. Mm. Just awesome. Three dollars to get in, Brothers Disco. I mean, this is a beautiful art form. Wow. And that's basically mm. it. The next booklet is just interviews of myself and. You know, Charlie Chase, Tony Tone. Tone and mm -hmm. But this I leave. Okay. Right. Oh, that's I fabulous. Wow. So, um, full time now, you're working on this, on the 
collection and your older photos, or are you still taking photos? I'm still taking pictures. Oh, what, where do you photograph now? Everywhere. This weekend I shot Public Enemy at BB King's. Oh. So I'm you have the, access to everybody? Yes, pretty much okay. now. I'm the house photographer at Lehman College. Oh. So I shoot. I shot BB King there last month. Jose Feliciano. Oh yeah. And it turns out Jose Feliciano lived in the Bronx. Lived in the Bronx. So no okay. kidding. Never knew that. He told the entire audience. Lived on because Elton. now you know lived everybody on, wants to be from the Bronx. Right? Lived, right? On, lived on <laughs> Elton <laughs> Avenue. They were denying it for years, and everybody lived on Elton no Avenue. Kidding. Moved down to to the village and used to smoke with you know, marijuana with Bob Dylan and all those people. Uh -huh. yeah, I remember. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, my 9 to 5, my bread and butter is New York City Fire Department. I'm also uh, the treasurer of my union. So when I'm not working in an ambulance saving lives, I'm out fighting City Hall for a better contract. Right. Yeah. And traveling. Mm -hmm. And then when I have time, my camera goes with me everywhere I go. Mm -hmm. You still do any Latin? Yeah. Photograph Latin yeah. bands? Yeah. I'm ones? doing a, a Gran Combo. Oh, no. Wait. June 16th. Yeah, right. Are they coming to Lehman? Yeah. Okay. Right okay. I'll be there. Um, I'm also the staff photographer for Hip Hop Connection magazine out in London. Whenever they need a New York photographer, they call me. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have photos of a Gran Combo? Yep. Old ones? No. Oh, that's something new. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Marvin, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask? Oh. Um, how does it feel to be, to have all that history? Because one of the things that, that's hard for me is that I don't have any of that from my neighborhood. And I miss that. You have, it, it's, like I said, and I'll keep saying, I'm blessed. Not only am I blessed of the contributions I've made to my culture, but of documenting my culture and to know your history. It is so wonderful to be able to ask, you know, for a kid or your own brother or sister to say, where did this come from or why did this happen and have the answers for that. It is, it's overwhelming. It's a really good feeling. And then I, I, I'm grateful to my grandmother who instilled those family values in me, you know, and my father for exposing me to a lot of my culture. You know, and it's just a good, you know, everybody should know where they came from, where they're going, their background. And to, to take it a step further and to document it like I have, it's just awesome. My second question, how do you feel about what's happening or what's slowly happening to the Bronx and how it's becoming a very place to live now. How do you feel about all that? I think, well, I've always felt it's been a place to live <laughs> I've always felt that. It's just now that the rest of the world <laughs> yeah. really it. it's really real. It's wonderful. It, I've always called this home, even though I've lived in various, you know, I've lived in Chevy Chase, Maryland, I lived in Columbia, South Carolina, Fayetteville, North Carolina, I've lived all over, you know, but Bronx has always been home for me, you know, my grandmother gave her life to making the Bronx a special place and for its people, and it's beautiful. Mm. It's getting a little bit expensive for me because, you know, everybody else wants to come right. live here, <coughs> but, um, born and raised here, I'll probably die here. Mm -hmm. You could do photography full time. I can. would do it in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. I would do it in a heartbeat, but I can't. I'm a family man. I need my pension. I need the benefits, the health benefits, and everything like that. I'm just grateful that I'm able to make some money. I know a lot of money, but to me, it's not about money for me. It's not. It's not. I love what. If you love. To do something, you won't, it's priceless. You, nobody can pay you to do something you love to do. Mm. They can't. So, you know, my job is, you know, my nine to five is saving lives and delivering babies, you know, working for, for the New York City Fire Department. Also being an activist, 
and involved in union and work. Because my grandma, my grandmother, besides a community activist, was a great union worker mm -hmm. also, advocate. So, you know, I'm grateful that she's instilled that in me and my mother's instilled that in me. But if I'm capable of doing something else that I love, which is my photography, great. Mm -hmm. And, you know, who would think 30 years later, That's you know, so your great. first love, now everybody wants to mm -hmm. be a part of it. I remember getting an email from from Mark over here after the New York Times piece. Who is this Joe Conto? Why don't mm -hmm. I have his work over <laughs> here? And, and this, that, the other way. <laughs> and now we're the yeah. best of friends. But, yeah. you know. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who's interested in documenting history through photography, through writing of their community? My secret to good photography is to take a lot of pictures. Everywhere. Carry, have that camera that you have whether it's a little one to a big one, whatever. Document, document, document. Read up on your culture, read up on your community. And you can't go wrong. You can't. You know, if photography is something you like to do, take pictures. I tell people the secret to a good photographer is to take a lot of pictures. You're bound to get one or two yeah, good right. shots. Mm -hmm. And in today's world of digital photography, you know, you understand something too. Back then, there was no digital photography. I had to buy my own rolls of film and develop them. That cost money. I didn't have no money. I didn't have no money. You know, maybe I'll steal twenty dollars from my mom's pocket or something like that. And she probably knew I was the one taking it, but she knew I was doing something good. You know. But you know, in today's photography world, you can buy a digital camera and take thousands and thousands of pictures and not spend them because your com your dark room now is your computer. You know, you do everything on your computer. You mm. delete what you don't want and save what you want. But his document your history. Document your surroundings. You just follow your dreams. And a lot of people well what I'll say to you, you know, in this idea you have for your project, there will be other people who did keep things. You know, once you uncover those people, you know, then they know somebody, or they got pictures, or they got kept there, so that. It'll so, be a snowball effect, because, yeah, yeah, you know, one yeah. person will know Fulano who's got this, and yeah, right. Fulano who's got this, and it's like, yeah. oh, I, I might have something in the closet. I mean, this project started with me doing one interview. And it's been a snowball. Right. A snowball turning into an avalanche, actually, which is a metaphor. One of the people who got involved, Harriet McFeeda, said, you know, this is going to turn into an avalanche. Mm -hmm. It's going to be out of control mm -hmm. because there's so much, so many people who want to tell their story. Mm -hmm. um, one question I wanted to ask you, which is sort of relevant to uh, Marvin, do barber shops have the same importance in Puerto Rican communities as they do in African American communities? Do people go back to the same barber shop for 40 years? I've been following the same barber, the same person, from barber shop to barber shop for the last 10 years. There's one person that cuts my hand, that's it. Mm -hmm. Barber shops are institutions in our communities. Uh -huh. They really are. No. They're the equivalent of, let's say, the mom's beauty, beauty yeah, parlor. Right. Mm -hmm. Very important in the, in yeah, the Spanish community, very important. very important in the black community. Yeah, so if you were looking in the Upper West Side, the barber shops are a place where, uh -huh. you know. Shoe repair. Yeah. The shoe repair. Pop, the mom shoe repair. The mom yeah. pop stores. The mom yeah. pop stores. Yeah. They're, they're that have there. survived. Yeah. You know, all it is. Mm -hmm. You know, those are great uh -huh. sources for information. A lot of them sell Puerto Rican sells. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh. Dawn, do you have any questions? Dawn, I got married in the grills. Oh, really? Jamaica, yeah. Oh, that's, <laughs> yeah. oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I Where just are you from? Oh, I'm ju from, from Kingston, Kingston, Jamaica. Yeah, right. No, it's just, I really related to uh, so much of what you said. Thank and, you, you know, um, being a video maker myself, I was like, a, you talked about, oh, you, you, you don't have to be concerned about 
money or anything because it really doesn't have anything to do yeah. with, with, with those things although you would love of course yeah <laughs> don't get me wrong yeah don't get me wrong but that's so totally yeah. irrelevant in a way uh -huh. that you're just happy that you I just it. love what I do yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay um I just want to thank you for an extraordinary experience for Thanks, all man. of us I think the, the thing about this interview is it touched each of us in different ways, in different parts of our experience, and that's a really powerful thing. So, you know, this is the beginning, not the end, because we're going to be working on a whole bunch of ways of bringing this to more people, this legacy, which is so precious mm -hmm. and so powerful. And so thank you so My much. My pleasure. Yeah. And are they going to do an exhibit in New York? Well, 